Namaste and good afternoon. On behalf of the Empowerment Committee of Flow Hyderabad and the Chairperson Shubhra Maheshwari, I Priya Gastar, Committee Head, welcome you all to this afternoon session, Navigating the Entrepreneurial Journey, the Highs, the Lows and the Belief. We are here today because we all believe in the power of entrepreneurship. The basic notion that if you've got an idea and if you really work hard, and you're able to pick yourself up, even if you stumble a couple of times, you can eventually turn that idea into a reality. Historically, it has been proved beyond an iota of doubt that it is the spirit of entrepreneurship that helps humanity tackle some of the greatest challenges that we face around the world. Our guest speaker today, Ms. Dipanmita Chattopadhyay, welcome ma'am, will reveal how in an interconnected world, entrepreneurship can break down barriers and help build capacity to work unitedly towards making the world a better place. But before that, let's pay our respects to India, the place of our dreams, our mother, our friend. I now invite Chairperson Flow Hyderabad, Shubhra Maheshwari, to share her thoughts with us. Good afternoon. I extend a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Chairman and CEO of IKP Knowledge Park, Ms. Dipanvita Chattopadhyay, and all our members present here across the country, a very, very warm welcome. At the outset, I would like to congratulate Ms. Dipanvita for being nominated as part of the engagement group of the G20 Startup 20 Task Force on Foundation. It is also a matter of pride that Flow is the official partner for G20. Innovations are proving to be a great equalizer in these times, and startups are a clear manifestation of viability and scaling of ideas of change. 
India has achieved considerable growth in the field of startups due to massive disruption in science and tech. It has also spurred the development of digital identity and digital public platforms for the country. Our startup ecosystem has grown tremendously since 2016, when there were just around 250 to over 90,000 at present. However, we will still need to find solutions to long-term challenges like climate change, poverty, inequality, health, education, and job-related issues. It is institutions like IKP Knowledge Park that are creating and enabling complete ecosystems for innovation and entrepreneurship that will not only help build a resilient and smarter India, but also help address burning global issues for the long run. I'm very happy that IKP Knowledge Park is extending its expertise and support to Flow Hyderabad as a knowledge partner for years to come. I urge Flow members from across India to benefit from these collaborations that we bring to you as an organization. And this is also the reason why we like to host these programs online so that people across the country can benefit. Members of Flow Hyderabad, please mark your calendars for February 9th. We are curating a very interesting afternoon for all of you. Without taking much time, I request Priya to take our session with the Panvitaji forward. Thank you, Shubhra. Um, my teammate Lavanya Gunda will now introduce our eminent speaker. Thank you, Priya, for the opportunity. Dipan Vita Chattopadhyay, Chairman and CEO of IKP, is credited with developing the first life science research park in Hyderabad, India. She pioneered a hardware product incubator and a makerspace IKP Eden in Bangalore and works with Indian and global partners to nurture and fund over 700 innovation projects and early startups. She is the director on the board of IKP Trust, IKP Ventures, Rich, and Human Pharmaceuticals Limited. She also holds office as the president of IKP Eden and is the founder chairman of Support Elders Private Limited. Dipan Vita serves as a treasurer of IASP, is on the Research Council of the CCMB, is an Executive Council member of AGNI, and on the Board of Governors of STEM, and also on the Governing Council of several Indian incubators. She is a member of several national level committees as well. She received the Fiki Flow Influential Women Award in 2021 for outstanding contribution to the innovation ecosystem. In 2018, she was awarded the Top Women Achievers of the Year 2017 in Asia by Asia One Business Magazine and Women of the Decade in Life Science and Innovation by the Women Economic Forum. Thank you. Thank you, Lavanya. And uh, that doesn't start to even describe uh, Deepanvita's achievements as I've seen very closely for the last 20 years. With that, we will start our main session. Audience, please keep your phones on silent. Drop your, drop your questions in the chat box for taking up later during our Q&A session. Ma'am, IKP is the star of Genome Valley Hyderabad. It was the first science and technology incubator in India. Can you tell us briefly about its evolution into a globally respected incubator? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Priya, and uh, thanks, Shubhra, and all of you uh, to give me this opportunity to talk to <laughs> so many members of Wikiflow. Uh, and as you said, and Shubhra said, that it is just not Wikiflow Hyderabad, but there are people who are joining from outside Hyderabad, uh, other chapters. So uh, thank you. And uh, a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, so you know, uh, when we started in 1999 and we became operational, as a research park and incubator. it's just not an incubator, it's a research park and incubator. We started our operations in 2000. The idea was what you do in the new millennium to make uh, India as a global part in just not an economic part in innovation, because uh, we all knew that innovation would lead to most of the solutions that the globe needs. So ICICI, this was started by ICICI Bank. So ICICI came uh, together with the government, then government of Andhra Pradesh, and we started uh, this park 
in Genome Valley, which is about 40 kilometers from the city. Uh, you'd all have heard about Bharat Biotech and Covaxin. So Bharat Biotech is our neighbor. And now this is a really uh, very good ecosystem, about 200 companies, largely pharmaceutical and biotech companies. But when we started in 2000, of course, Bharat Biotech started before us, I think in 1987, and we were there, there was nothing there. So it was actually a great effort for all of us to put this innovation ecosystem together. So if the question is, what made this? It is our belief that innovation actually would uh, solve the problems of today and tomorrow, especially tomorrow. So the idea was just not to have an incubator, to have the entire ecosystem where there are large companies, mid-sized companies and small companies, all of them come together. The enablers come together. IKP is one of the enablers. Fiki Flow is another enabler because you are enabling the ecosystem by making uh, all these members, uh, entrepreneurs, and even budding entrepreneurs come together and understand how to take their businesses to scale. And so we are all agents of change, just like the entrepreneurs are agents of change. Uh, Priya, I must say that even Fiki Flow or IKP, the mission actually is to bring about change, bring about change in a very positive manner. And we've chosen to bring about the change through the path of innovation, not necessarily innovating ourselves, but helping others innovate, helping entrepreneurs grow. And uh, that's how IKP became successful. Thank you. I hadn't unmuted. <laughs> Absolutely. I just love that interpretation that, yes, uh, Fiki Flow is also an enabler. Yes. Maybe we still haven't described ourselves as that, but we should start doing so. Um, because so many of our uh, members are, uh, like you said, they are social impact organizations also helping a lot of women come together and do things on a larger scale for larger women. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. So, when you were asked to lead IKP uh, close to 25 years ago, at a time when business incubation was still in its very nascent stages, what were the challenges that you faced and how did you deal with them? Okay, so let me start. So I was an employee of ICICI uh, in Mumbai and I was asked to head this uh, new venture of ICICI. It was a not-for-profit, structured as a not-for-profit. So not in the core business of ICICI Bank, as you know, the bank, uh, but uh, watch Mr. Kamath, he was the MD of ICICI at that point of time. Mr. Kamath told me, Dipanita, you have to be ahead of the curve. What does it mean? That you have to do things, what is necessary for the ecosystem, what others are not doing. Keep your ears and eyes open to see what is required? So that has been our mantra, to be ahead of the curve, to do new things. So we are agile and our strategy is to align with the innovation needs of the country and the globe. So if I start giving you uh, examples of what are the new things we could bring in, uh, we started as the first life sciences park, as you told Priya. And uh, that was in 1999-2000. We were and the incubation part that you asked about. We are the first private incubator to be recognized and funded by the Department of Science and Technology, National Science and Technology Entrepreneurship Board. That was way back in 2005. We started our incubator in 2006. Before that, we were actually looking at mid-sized companies. And uh, then we said, let's look at multinational companies on one hand, get some of them in and look at the startup ecosystem. The startup ecosystem at that time was very, very fragile. Uh, there were not so many. It was not a buzzword. Start, startup was not a buzzword. Entrepreneurs were there, but it was quite a task 
to bring entrepreneurs together without access to capital. Because as all of you know, it is not the traditional lending business. Banks do not lend to people who do not have money. Those who have money, bank is willing to give them more money. But how do you start a business when you have very little money? We need seed capital. At that time when we started, that was one of the challenges our startup said. They had the idea. They were willing to do new things. But those who didn't have, so have money could not really progress. I, very few people would understand the challenge in the 2006, 2007 era when there was very little capital available to do new things. And uh, so our effort was uh, to actually put together funds along with the government. And we were one of the first to start a very early uh, seed capital or venture capital, or very early VC fund for innovation along with Department of Science and Technology and private investors. And we started funding. So, so our idea again, Priya, is to make the innovation ecosystem more uh, vibrant. And funding was the necessity. So we put up funding. Uh, then we realized that uh, since we are in the field of life sciences, we realized that government is putting up something called BIRAC. BIRAC Regional Innovation a Center is something that we started along with BIRAC. We were the first regional innovation center of BIRAC. And if you do not know what BIRAC is, BIRAC is the Bi uh, Biotechnology Industry Research Assistance Council of the Department of Biotechnology. So Department of Biotechnology, Government of India formed BIRAC to work with industry and academia, and the, of course the policy uh, arm of the government to make innovations possible. So we promptly started working with BIRAC and we were, we were chosen to be a regional center of BIRAC. That's a great privilege that we have. Now there are three or four more regional centers, but we were the first there. Then, uh, you know, Priya, we, as we were going along, we realized that there is very little prototyping uh, facilities available in the country for young startups, students who are coming out of college uh, to build uh, their minimum viable products or to say their uh, proof of concept quickly if these are engineering or product level uh, things. So we were one of the first to put up a maker space in Bangalore. It's called IKP Eden. And now there are maker spaces everywhere. Uh, you won't believe uh, there are tinkering labs in schools and there are maker spaces in all colleges. It was not so in 2014, 15, 2015 when we started. I forgot to mention about the grand challenge. You know, uh, again, you're we talking of how do you put funds together? And we started working with the Gates Foundation from Seattle. They, they gave us a, a grant to, it is called the Grand Challenges Explorations Grant. That's the first time a Grand Challenge came to India. And we were the implementing partner of the Gates Foundation. And now you'll see all organizations, government, ministries, they all run challenge grants. And we feel so proud that uh, we started in 2011 with a grand challenge program. So whenever we saw Priya challenge, your question was, how do we deal with challenges? We deal with challenges by hustling, putting up uh, uh, partnerships and trying to solve the problem. Our idea is to uh, make life easier for startups and entrepreneurs and innovators. Absolutely. So that's why I think you have so many uh, marquee uh, brands that graduated from IKP, I think uh, the biggest one being Loris. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Loris is one. And when uh, very recently uh, a company came to us and I said, but you're so new, he said, we will be bigger than Loris. So, you know, people actually, those aspirations have been built. So I love that. And also international companies have made their home in IKP. 
Right. So I can see the brand going places. Um, so with that background, you would have seen entrepreneurs at every stage of their business cycle. Can you tell us some of the unique traits that ensure success in the long run? Uh, that's a very good question, Priya. You know, if I have to say what makes a difference between uh, an entrepreneur and somebody uh, who is doing just run-of-the-mill business, maybe a work, everybody needs to have passion. Without passion, you cannot do things well. Pursuit of excellence, I don't think it's just entrepreneurs. Each person in their own field, whatever you are managing in your own life, pursuit of excellence is required. But what an entrepreneur also requires, passion is definitely because you want to change the world. You want to build something that, is, uh, that will make a difference. You need vision. If you don't dream of what can come before uh, you, what can happen five years hence, 10 years hence, you will not be able to sculpt the picture. You will be, you'll be solving tasks. You will be solving small problems. You will not be able to provide a dream that can even come true. So vision is something that I would put. Vision, passion, pursuit of excellence, perseverance and grit. It's so easy to say that in, in all startups go through, all entrepreneurs go through patches of difficult phases and then hypes. So when it's a low, and the question was the highs and lows, I think you need that perseverance and grit and belief in yourself. You have to believe that I can do, that yes, I can do kind of power actually would drive an entrepreneur. But at the same time, you have to have prudence to know uh, when things are going wrong. You have to have humility to accept mistakes and failures. You have to have empathy. You have to have integrity. Without integrity, you cannot progress far. So I would stop at that. <laughs> so I'm staying on that. There is this grand debate about, you know, persistence versus stubbornness. Uh -huh. So okay. undoubtedly persistence is a trait. Every innovator, every entrepreneur should bring to the table. But stubbornness to accept that the idea is not taking off uh -huh. in spite of years of sustained effort, in spite of all the, you know, funding or whatever refunding that has been done. All uh -huh. this can harm the business more. So hmm. when should an entrepreneur call it quits? Is there an ideal time period? Is it <laughs> defined by that? Is it defined by how many number of times one has to return and rejig an idea? How does it work? Can uh, you think somebody uh, calling it quits? I would think it's ultimately a gut feel. But so we are talking of uh, persistence, perseverance, and you said stubbornness. You know, you have to have the grit. You have to be. You have to look at all possible ways of uh, succeeding in your dream. But in spite of that, two things. If you, your incremental revenue, uh, I'm not talking, because initially you may have a high capex, you've put it sunk in money, but your incremental cost and incremental revenue over a period of time, if it is not matching, then there is a problem in the business. Even if you don't make it cover all the losses, incrementally you have to see whether your revenues can sustain the business. You have, do you have the cash flow? You may, many, many businesses actually falter uh, when you run out of cash. Then you do not have any avenues for cash. So, um, my mentor Bala had told me one of the things that all the difference between a startup and any other employee is you have to meet the payroll at the end of the month. You have to meet the payroll. Whether you take any money home or not does not matter. You have to meet the payroll. So being able to pay salaries, to meet the requirements of vendors and all, 
to be able to service your loans. I think these are very important areas. But you have to have your eye on growth. Sometimes you see all these. Today, if you see a lot of companies are actually spending a lot more than what they make. Typically, startups, which are unicorns, uh, except for a few like Zoho or Zeroda, you'll see that's the story. Uh, they burn much more because VCs force them to actually scale, 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 grow without having uh, uh, the commensurate revenue model to back them up because you are trying to capture the market. But everybody is not a unicorn. Everybody doesn't have that VC backing. And you, even if you have a VC backing, I think it's always prudent to build a business around revenues. Top line is most important. Bottom line is also as important because you have to have uh, an eye to see that whether your incremental revenue and uh, uh, expenses are in sync or not. So I think those are triggers. Those will tell you that your business, there's something wrong with the business. Then what you typically, what would a startup do? What would you, you would try to pivot. You try to see, tweak your business model, change something. You actually try and raise funds from elsewhere because ultimately you're not doing it uh, just to earn your living, you're doing it most probably to change the status quo. You, you, this is your dream. So you do not call quits so easily, but at the same time, you have to be prudent and say, okay, this is not working. I need to relook at the business model. Let me take a step back. But what happens, you know, you have so many employees. So it's, it's a very complex thing to be able to uh, say, yes, I want to quit. At times, you pass on the reins to a professional CEO who can run the business, maybe if it's not working. So I think you have to be able to say, when I'm not feeling completely engaged in this business. I would Ma'am, today um, it is the YOLO economy, the you only live once kind of philosophy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It, is, it is definitely a byproduct of COVID-19, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, and this has brought about a paradigm shift in work culture. Even we see, or I think most companies would agree with me, that nowadays when employees walk in, the first question they ask is, is it a five-day week? Okay. <laughs> For them, you know, the work-life balance or whatever you call it, it's, yeah. it's, really, it's really up there in their priority list. And okay. autonomous professionals, um, they are looking for freedom. They're looking for flexibility, fulfillment. This is the next big trend. And surprisingly, the mid-career professionals are opting to strike out on their own. So what are your observations on this? This phenomenon that is suddenly upon us. That's a, that's a great question, Priya, I must say. You know, uh, yeah, the gig economy and a lot of people want, are trying to try it on their own because of maybe layoffs, because they had a chance, they had a chance to be at home and relook at what they're doing. For various reasons that the pandemic uh, kind of, not always because of force, but because uh, Maybe there's an opportunity and people are looking at various options. To your question of this, uh, I liked your question of this uh, mid-career or uh, people opting to start up. Well, there's a statistics, um, the US statistics is, and this is for everyone to guess, uh, what is in the US the average age of a startup founder? Who can guess? I would say around 21, 22. Any guesses, ladies? You can... 45? 35. 43. It is because we hear of Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs. They are exceptions. But actually, more... Uh, harder and deep tech it goes, it actually rises 45 or 46, but the average age is 43. So in India, uh, if you 
tech, only the tech companies. It's I think the, I had seen a data which says about 29, whether it's 29 or 32, it's around that. But if you take all startup companies, it's around 37. So it is actually what you said, the mid-career people around 35 to 37, 40 in India, where people actually start taking this bets of, because what happens, you know, you've done a career, you've learned your skills, you've honed your skills, you're good at something, you're more grounded, maybe your children are kind of not very young. And this is it. And you also have savings and you try to do what you want to do. You said you live only once. It actually, people think if I don't do it now, it may become too late. And so that's the time. And I, what makes the difference is the courage to leap. You know, our school motto, I studied in Kolkata. Uh, the name of the school is South Point High School. Our uh, school motto was courage to know. And I've always been so fascinated by the word courage to know. And here I'm saying courage to leap and take the take that leap of faith. Take the risk. Believe in yourself. And uh, I think uh, that is the age. The difference about uh, just 21, 22 uh, out of college kids is they're taking the risk without knowing what's there. And they feel that they can fall back upon this brilliant world and they can fall back upon their parents. And today is there's a startup support and so on and so forth. But people in mid-career are much more grounded. If they get into something, oftentimes it will be in an area where they have expertise or they have huge passion to deliver and they know how to do it through various means. So I feel uh, that's the ideal stage to start up between 35 and 45. But any age is fine. Don't take me wrong. 57 is fine. 26 is fine too. That, does that make sense, Priya? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, statistics are also showing the same thing. Yeah. That mostly it's Medicare. And your interpretation that they are more settled and they are not able to take the, maybe the wife is working. So spouse. Yeah, the spouse. It's not wife. It's yeah, spouse. Yeah, I would want the women to do this. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> or partner. So um, coming to what's happening now around the world, um, Google, Microsoft, Salesforce, they've all announced large scale layoffs. Okay. And what yeah, does yeah. this mean for the global economy? And somewhere, is there a hidden opportunity for the smaller companies? Okay. Um, you know, why suddenly you are saying so? So there is so much uncertainty in the global uh, economy today because of pandemic, because of the Ukraine war, because of uh, the suddenly globalization. So there are these sm smaller groups that are being formed closing of economies. Uh, so all this has created a lot of uncertainty in business. And that is why people are consolidating. I was going through some statistics on uh, layoffs by large companies. Um, Tarang, I'll come to your question later. It's an interesting question, uh, but I'll just uh, answer this question of Priya. Uh, so, uh, you know, while there are large-scale scale-offs, there is also hiring in areas where they are seeing business in. Maybe they're hiring in different uh, skill sets, but there is hiring. And it's not that these companies like Google are shrink or Amazon are shrinking. It's only they are restructuring their business models, their requirements. Uh, so at this time, um, I think there are people who are also the employees who are unsettled, people who are working, they think that they need to really rethink what they're doing. So um, I feel uh, as a startup company, 
as an entrepreneur, you could actually actively look at some of these people. They're people with skills and experience. And we need people in our company with skills and experience. They could become an employee. They could become an advisor. They could become a consultant. I think there are various modes of engagement. And we need to look at that in a very positive manner. Because uh, if there are people available in our ecosystem, let's tap that. Now, again, something which is a burning topic. Actually, this uh, should have gone into the Q&A session, but I can't help it. Coming from a content and design creation background, I want to ask you this. What uh, is it? I just read the other day one Mr. Santiago who said, AI won't replace you. A person using AI will. So this has caught the imagination of the Twitterati and it's, it's, right, it's on fire. Also, <laughs> Amazon... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'll Amazon, finish. And then. Amazon has also just claimed that 80% of all the world's data will be collated over the next six months. And generative AI like ChatGPT, DALI, they're literally putting the power of content and visual development in the hands of just anybody. So what does all this mean for the world down the road? Is it going to kill individual innovation? But it wasn't the case when automation came. Everybody said, oh, individual in innovation and all will go down the drain. But it did not happen. So what do you have to say about AI, AI taking over our life or even starting to think for us? Um, this is my take. And this is a lot of things being written on ChatGPT and what ChatGPT can deliver, what it cannot deliver. And that is only a beta version. As the versions improve, there will be much more a twist in it, all those bugs will get sorted. You know, there is a med school uh, in the US, uh, a med school paper has been answered to a reasonable satisfaction by ChatGPT. So it says that if the answer resides somewhere, it has the power to pull that information very quickly. And this is actually, as you mentioned, it's a generative AI. It's not the AI of five years, uh, five years back or two years back. So AI itself is uh, actually changing what artificial intelligence is. But, so, mm, but I think this gives us enormous power to be creative. And see, what is not there, completely new, can ChatGPT generate that? It will make maximum compete with you it will not be able to because you are doing it completely new to the world so it gives us an opportunity to actually use the human ability uh, to a very different way what it would do is do the uh, mm, what to say the maybe uh, putting routine work to be handled by the robots or various means. But then I think it would be actually uh, the role of humanity to be able to use ChatGPT in a manner that it enables the good things that has not been able, that has not happened because human power is just limited to this much. I think it is like uh, we want very good computational people and ChatGPT will be that. So it's actually it's going to augment your skill structure, but it will help you become much more innovative. Whether ChatGPT can think of uh, empathy and businesses that would require empathy. I don't know. So you, I think if we are a thinking generation, if we are people who are willing to remodel the way we do work and put much more effort in creativity, I don't think AI, AI would do a catching up job. I, I still believe in the creative. In fact, uh, Priya, you know, I didn't know this question is coming to me, but this, anywhere I go, 
this question is coming to me. Yes. So it's um, kind of, so I have actually put two very, uh, mm, two uh, poems, part of it, uh, I've actually put it down on the screen uh, for me to read out to all our uh, friends who've come together uh, to listen to this fireside chat. Uh, so, uh, all, and if you allow me, I'll just do yes. that. Yes, of course, ma'am. So, uh, Maya Angelou uh, is a great favorite uh, humanist and poet uh, of mine. Uh, many of you would have heard or not heard, but read Maya Angelou's uh, poems. Uh, she wrote a poem. Uh, uh, okay, let me give the background. Carl Sagan, uh, when Voyager 1 uh, went and took pictures uh, of the Earth from the outer solar system, uh, Carl Sagan called it a pale blue dot. We are nobody in this huge solar system. We are just a pale blue dot. We are a speck of dust, a speck of moat uh, uh, on a beam of sunshine. We are just that as, as the Earth. And Carl Sagan was giving a talk at, um, I think, uh, at Cornell in 1994. And Maya Angelou heard him and she, in her own way, interpreted uh, science. So that's why, you know, these are power of connections. Uh, somebody talks of science and you, as a humanist, can connect it in a, at a different level. So she wrote a poem called A Brave and Startling Truth in 1995, which went to become uh, the UN poem of, UN adopted that poem. So I'm not going to read the poem. I'm just going to read the last two paragraphs for you. Uh, and I quote, when we, come, when we come to it, we, this people on this wayward floating body, created on this earth, of this earth, have the power to fashion for this earth a climate where every man and every woman can live freely without sanctimonious piety, without crippling fear. When we come to it, we must confess that we are the possible. We are the miraculous, the true wonder of the world. That is when and only when we come to it. I think we are the possible. We are the miraculous. We are the true one. It is not the pyramid or the Taj or the Grand Canyon. That's the wonder of the world. We are the wonder. We have to believe. But that is when and only when we come to it, when we realize what is the power of working together. So that is uh, for all of you uh, gathered here today. That's a message from Maya Angelou via me. And the other is another famous uh, and very, very dear poet, uh, uh, poem of mine called Bloom by Emily Dickinson. You know, it's so beautiful. So bloom is result. When you see a bloom, it's a result. To meet a flower and casually glance would cause one scarcely to suspect the minor circumstance assisting in the bright affair, so intricately done, then offered as a butterfly to the meridian, to pack the bud, oppose the worm, obtain its right of dew, adjust the heat, elude the wind, escape the prowling bee, great nature not to disappoint, awaiting her that day to be a flower. To be a flower is profound responsibility. So all of you are flowers. You have a profound responsibility to do because you have guarded so many things to become a flower. Thank you, Priya. Wonderful. You've just transported us somewhere. And I remember from years ago, I read a quote from Maya. Um, this was about history. She said, history, despite its wrenching pain, 
cannot be unlived but if faced with courage you can live again absolutely absolutely so i think same way for innovation and entrepreneurship <laughs> yes so um that will bring us towards the end of our talk ma'am um what kind of support can flow an organization of us business women can look forward to from ikp because we have just started our engagement this is what we so i think this is what we are doing we are engaging <laughs> yeah the way we could do it is uh, i <laughs> would think uh, how one on one and one to many discussions like this where we hold each other's hand we give direction where we understand we bring mentors from our networks to bring a different perspective and uh, i think that would be the best way uh, to help uh, mentorship and networking events that we host and co-host i would love to do that it could be very specific ones because i don't know exactly what businesses uh, your members are in we could make it into smaller uh, groups where we talk about that business we bring mentors for those businesses we could actually look at corporate governance we could look at intellectual property because that is one of our uh, verticals we can talk about intellectual property and tech transfer a trademark how to protect it how to transfer uh, and so on and so forth we can look at regulatory assistance when i say regulatory assistance if you're a food company it's fssi who's looking at if you are doing anything in healthcare business it is a very regulated market which ones have to be regulated where do you submit these regulations how do you take it forward we are launching a regulatory uh, ikp global regulatory forum on 16th of february in bangalore and we will have a session of that also at bioasia on the 24th of february uh, it's a program with able so that is something we can help uh, yes um, working with the team at ikp we have just put together a small slide which is in a nutshell tells how you know because our people would like to know uh, you know like you said you don't know where our uh, you know our members are working in which sectors so if, if they understand in which sectors you can lend a support can with your permission can i just play that slide and then you can maybe sure. explain a little so, bit absolutely yeah. absolutely uh, it team can we have that one slide that we put together please <clears throat> so in a nutshell this was what we put together so ma'am if you can just start you just spoke about ip and legal and all that so there was actually also a question that was flashed i did not read it now i've gone to the chat to check i think it's from tarun at ikp is there a uh, uh, or a particular industries that you support or is it across board uh so there are certain things that are sector agnostic like i said corporate governance and stuff like that but uh these are the sectors where we work largely life sciences and agri sustainability ai robotics is there everywhere and some amount of engineering as well yes okay. so uh, members from any of these sectors can approach ikp for uh, okay, okay. so ladies it's pharma biotech healthcare medical devices agriculture sustainability ai and robotics now and ikp will be able to support with mentoring funding sure. infrastructure and incubation ip and legal commercialization networking and peer learning yeah sure absolutely i'll be most happy to i think there's a question from suma uh priya which says i have a patentable innovation in waste management and uh, require funds for prototype and seed capital and need mentorship guidance to seek it from right sirs lost a 10 million funding from undp niti ayog um investor consortium uh uh the round covid and facing challenges it's a social innovation product uh suma 
can we uh, talk uh, take it offline and talk uh, separately or you want to introduce your uh, product or talk now uh, i'm comfortable either ways uh, because i've been applying for the bayrak as well big grant so what because, happened okay yeah, so, <laughs> there's no point asking what happened <laughs> but i think um, actually the 21st call is open now uh, it will close on 15th of february uh, so there is still time so if you can get my email id from priya priya if you can link yes. send it you can call connecting suma and me and vishu that should be good because vishu and his team is looking at Dr. Vishwanathan, uh, yeah, he's my colleague. Dr. Vishwanathan, and then he has uh, referred me to Agri University. That is uh, AIDA now, and then I've been applying through that. My challenge was a very different thing because initially okay. I was doing both the organic and inorganic ways both. So they said organic ways, biogas plants, we will not fund. That has been a failed model, so we do not want to get into it. So I asked. They asked me to apply, revise the whole thing, apply only for the non-biodegradable. So when I worked on the non-biodegradable, they said the next uh, phase. They said it's too huge a project for the, uh, the timeline as well as the budget. So take only a part of it. And the third, the last one, uh, 2021, when I applied for that, they I abridged again. It's all as per the you know Virax uh, suggestions and reviews. Abridged it only to one patent, one product. So they said now we, it doesn't involve the biotechnology, so we cannot fund you. So that was in the TEP round, wherein I scored around uh, to ninety-four point some percent in the even the, uh, <laughs> the scoring. Well, well. That's really yeah. it is uh, taking you. So yeah. I would like to look at what your presentation is and maybe talk to you um, yeah. if we can do it, Priya, on Saturday. Yeah, sure. Because that's the only day I have some time. Otherwise, uh, actually. Actually, or because uh, if she has to uh, take a decision on applying again, I'm not so sure whether she should be applying for BIG or is there something else that can be done. But um, I think uh, we can talk either on the third or fourth if you can connect, Priya. Sure, sure. Suma, you can please just call me and I can. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, is there uh, any other question, anybody? Yeah, I think Shilpa Raju will handle the Q and A for now. Shilpa. Oh, sorry, I, I started doing it myself. No, oh, no, so that's so sorry, Shilpa. No, no, we no, did no get, at all. We did get some questions with the registration, so I think she will. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Dipanvita, ma'am. Um, uh, being an entrepreneur myself and going on this journey. I'm sure that I speak on behalf of everybody that's been here is here also that today we all believe a little more in ourselves and your speech has really really inspired us. Thank you so much. Um, so the first question that we've got from one of our members, uh, Ishika, is what are the different types of financial options available for startup fundraising? So um, just to give it uh, talk about it broadly, there's grant. And then there is uh, uh, capital, which is called risk capital, where people put in and expect an upside later. And I'll talk about various instruments of risk capital. And then there is traditional, the lending business. Uh, so grants are uh, money that is given, maybe sometimes with some condition or largely without condition. If your project is part of a scheme of the government of, of a philanthropy, whether it is Gates Foundation or any other uh, philanthropic organization. So these are grants that are available. Very early stage proposals, some many a times uh, take uh, a grant to start their business. And uh, several government, there's Niti Ayo grant called Seed Support Money, that's given DST gets, gives seed support money. And uh, these are also small amounts of money available with various incubators in various uh, organizations and colleges. Now, uh, the bank loan system, whether it is, you, you have to have a revenue stream to service the loan because there may be a moratorium where you there is an interest moratorium 
and then you have to start repaying the capital sometimes there is no moratorium on the interest and it's only on the capital you have to start returning the money so if if you don't have a business where there is a revenue stream you really cannot go to a bank uh, for working capital loan or uh, getting a loan the other problem with most banks is they ask for collaterals and startups many a times would not have a collateral to pledge uh there are um, now uh, government schemes where uh, up to a crore it's collateral free but those are also very difficult to get uh, nabard has on agriculture uh, areas and if you've seen the budget today there is a lot of focus on agriculture and agriculture uh, businesses uh, including agriculture startup businesses and there's a startup loan that is going to cap up for agriculture but uh, apart from agriculture there is also sidbi the small uh, development bank uh, so sidbi also has some uh, a mudra scheme had some collateral free uh, loan but uh, most banks do not like the idea of providing a collateral free loan because they are worried whether they will get the money how will they recover so the other the third bucket is basically risk capital where somebody who believes in what you are doing is willing to give you some money expecting an upside when you succeed so they are giving you money with an expectation that you will succeed and then you will give them a multiple of that money back so that is it can be an angel it can be a seed capital it can be a venture capital company depending on where your which stage of your business is in if it's very early stage you've just done a poc it would be an angel who comes in literally the word angel who actually comes and believes in you it's typically an individual or a group or network of angels like hyderabad angels and then of course you have people who are in the early stage of venture capital which is called pre vc money seed money pre seed money these are about maybe a crore 2 crore kind of money and then anything above 1 million dollar uh, or on the north of it those would come in the purview of early venture capital money i'm not talking of late stage vcs you're talking of so but what happens is when it's early stage money it is given as a uh, a kind of a debt is not a debt it is a risk capital but is signed because your valuation we don't know because what happens in equity you subscribe to the equity of the company but here we are not uh, and you say this is the valuation of your company at this point but for a very early stage but how do you even do a valuation so you say that it will be delayed it will be done at a later date and uh, that's it's called ccd a compulsory a convertible debenture whether it's compulsory or convertible that's it so there are two these things i we can do a separate class on it i don't think we should i should talk more about it but there these are the yeah. instruments so so from what i understand just to sort of summarize in a very simple way so there are three major ways one is grants and other uh, the area then you don't need debt. to return the money you don't need to yeah there's debt so bank loans and then there's equity where you get your vcs and private equities and all that. so majorly this is a very These big umbrella but yeah yeah okay thank you ma'am um so we have another question uh, uh in your experience what are the common mistakes that startups or small entrepreneurs tend to make on their journey to wherever they want to reach there is several mistakes they make uh, they probably think uh, they have hit something that nobody else could ever so they overvalue their idea idea without execution ha- doesn't have much value so they they hold it very close to their chest they think people will steal their idea they don't want to talk of their idea so they get kind of possessed i think that's something so they are unable to unshackle themselves to grow that's one 
and then uh, because you are talking of the mistakes that startup do sometimes what happens they if they are into techies and they are into tech business they think any cool product would sell without doing customer discovery customer discovery means you have to find out what customers need whether it's a real product that will sell or not so i think that's where a lot of people fail because they have not done enough of uh, customer discovery the second once you have the poc it's called the, the whether there's a product market fit just not a customer discovery whether that product is good what your competitors are so that those analysis people tend to be very bookish and don't actually rely they rely on what they think is right and not what customer is asking yeah i think that's one of the toughest things to overcome is because you believe in it so much that <laughs> you don't want to hear anybody say that it's not even yeah. any small change becomes difficult um so we have another question uh, from suda what is the one thing that first time founders should remember when they're trying to get the interest of a potential investor okay investors time is very important they keep seeing proposals after proposals they receive you are not the only one so you should respect their time you have to go very well prepared you have to know that they have seen businesses in and out and they know exactly what uh, uh, they are looking at so you have to be able to have a very precise understanding of what you want to talk if you have 5 minutes you have to have just pitching for 5 minutes if 10 minutes you have to have various kinds of preparation to do a 5 minute pitch or a 10 minute pitch or an elevator pitch or a half an hour detailed discussion and i think all that would be very important thank you so much ma'am i think that, that brings us to the end of the question and answer round i would hand it back to priya thank you so much for uh, clearing our doubts thanks thank you shilpa and uh, thank you so much dipanvita um as shilpa mentioned your journey your observations have actually challenged i think each one of us to go back from here with a greater dream um, than what we have so- seen so far mm. to live with a purpose and enable uh, a long line of lives and families by empowering them to live with dignity and uh, what greater legacy can anyone hope to leave behind especially when you're mentoring so many people and helping them realize their dreams kudos to all the mentors and incubators that are doing such a wonderful job ikp being yeah. the star right. amongst them and uh, on behalf of chairperson shubhra maheshwari and the empowerment committee at flow hyderabad thank you once again for joining us here we are grateful to dr vishwanathan dupatla of ikp for facilitating this session i thank all the attendees from across flow chapters and from hyderabad for joining us here on this platform where we meet we learn we discuss matters that enrich and empower thank you so much namaskar so uh, with uh, your permission uh, i'll take leave now and thanks. thanks and just believe in you and you are just great thanks bye bye thank you thank you, thank you. vishwanathan garu can you just keep it on for 3 4 minutes and then we can close